Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody this morning? Blessed. Blessed. Amen. So, um, most of y'all have probably noticed that we have, that, that, that our church, Grace Church Red Rock, has a logo. It has a, it has a dove on it um, and a Bible that has a little motto, loving people into the kingdom of God. But it also has two words on it. Those words are truth and grace. Truth and grace. And uh, this morning I want to I talk about grace. I want to talk about truth some as well. Um, I, I get accused I get accused pretty regularly of being too quick to go to the Word of God and say, hey, this is what the Word of God says. We, we shouldn't be doing this, or we should be doing this, or um, here's the problem with that. And, and maybe going to the Word of God and sticking to the Word of God at the expense of, I get accused at the expense of um, being merciful or understanding. or And I don't think I get accused a lot of being judgmental. I don't think I'm judgmental, but God will be the judge of that. Um, but there's a reason why I'm very quick to go to the Bible. I would much rather, I would much rather when I get to the judgment seat of God that that I, I would rich, much rather be accused at trembling too much at His Word. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think we can tremble too much at the Word of God than that I had been a little too nonchalant about it or had made it a little too gray, a little too warm and fuzzy. Um, and so I do think we really need to know what the Word of God says and we need to believe it and we need to take it seriously. Um, I think another reason I'm so quick to go to the Word of God and so quick to to, um, I guess the word almost is admonish. The Bible tells us that we need to be prepared to admonish one another is because I see an awful lot of what I'll, I'll just call picking and choosing, right? Going through the Bible and picking out the verses that I really like and latching onto those and claiming those oftentimes out of context um, without, without the whole word of God. And, and I see a lot of I see a lot of churches doing this. Um, there are churches that will tell you that they never talk about sin because sin is ugly. We don't talk about anything ugly here. Negative. It's negative. We don't talk about repentance. People don't like to repent. We talk about things that make them want to come here and put money in the offering plate and feel good when they leave. God wants us to feel good when we leave. Um, and there's... I believe there's way too much of that going on in the church in America. And I'm not trying to say, you need to feel lousy when you leave here. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but I am trying to, I, I do believe God wants me to speak against bad doctrine. Um, and picking and choosing the verses that you like and clinging on to those and ignoring the ones you don't like is not good doctrine. Um, the other one that, that I think... God wants me to speak out against is I'll just lump it all together and call it the love wins doctrine. The doctrine that God really doesn't mean a whole lot of what he's saying here. He really isn't going to hold us accountable for our actions. Um, he really loves all of us so much that he's just going to not only gloss over anything we say or do, but he's going to gloss over his word and what his word says about that so that we can all go to heaven. And while God is very merciful and very forgiving and very patient, and I'm going to talk about that this morning, um, I think it's very, very dangerous to, to come into this attitude that God loves me so much that, hey, I can do what I want. It's okay. God's going to forgive me. I can believe what I want. And, and that's a very popular doctrine. Why? Because it tickles the ears. And the Bible tells us that as the end approach, more and more people will turn from sound doctrine to that which tickles the ears. So if I get accused of not tickling the ears enough, I'll receive that. Um, but I do want to talk this morning about 
it's not the flip side of that. We can't have truth without grace or grace without truth. Okay, the truth is we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The truth is there is none righteous, no, not one. The truth is we have all gone astray. We have all gone astray like sheep we have gone astray. And the truth is that without grace, it wouldn't matter how much we confessed our sins. It wouldn't much, matter how much penance we did. It wouldn't matter how much good we did. It wouldn't matter how much money we put in the offering plate. It wouldn't matter how often we gathered. How often we... It, none of that would matter without grace. We're saved by grace. And so this morning I want to talk about God's grace. And first I want to talk about what happens... Just briefly, I want to talk about what happens what happens when we sin. Okay? When we sin, we separate ourselves from God. I'm not going to... I didn't even pull up any verses for that. There are plenty of verses we could go to, to to support that. But when we sin, we put a barrier up between us and God. God can have no fellowship with sin. Fortunately, the Bible tells us that if we're born again, if we're if we have repented, if we are in fact God's, that all we need to do is confess our sin to Him, and He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So all those barriers that we put up, all of those walls we put up, all those things we've done to separate us, He takes those. Out. He wants those out of the way. He wants that fellowship with us. But then I want to ask, what happens when we go astray? And by that I mean. We all know people who have come to church, they've heard the gospel, they've confessed the Lord, they've been baptized, fill in the blanks, and then they've gotten completely off that path. They've gone and jumped back into that pit they were in before. They've returned to their vomit, as the Bible says. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really sensitive to this one because I hear it so much in the jails. Uh, I know a lot of men in jail there's a, there's a brother in there right now who is really into the Word of God, but I've known him for 15 years because he has been coming back for 15 years. And, and believe it or not, there are a lot of believers in jail. Just because we're believers doesn't mean we're not going to go do stupid stuff. In fact, is anyone in here going to can hold up their hand and tell me that they don't do stupid stuff. Later. <laughs> Behave. <laughs> and, and some of us don't go to jail for our stupid stuff. Some of us do. And so they'll come back. And because they have experienced the Holy Spirit in their lives, and because they have made a public profession of faith and been baptized, and they get back into the Word, and they and they come across verse, they come across passages like Second Peter two twenty, or or Hebrews ten twenty six, or Hebrews six four, and 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 it scares them, which is good, right? Godly sorrow produces repentance, but they say, but they ask, as if I'm God, but they but they, I'm the one with the Bible, and I'm the one who um, is there to to teach the Word of God, and so they want to know, God, it, Ted, can God forgive me? Can I, can I, I'm way off the path. Will God let me back on the narrow path, the difficult path and the narrow gate? And the answer is absolutely. For one thing, none of us is immune from getting way off the path. I'm going to think about, I'm going to throw out some people. King David, did he ever get off the path? Way, way, way off the path. And yet the Bible continues to say, except in the matter of Uriah, he was a man after God's own heart. S Solomon. Solomon got way off the path. And uh, according to the 11th chapter of First Kings, he didn't get back on it. And yet God blessed him with more knowledge and more wisdom than anyone. And he still got led astray. He had a weak spot. Okay, I'm, I don't even need to name it, but he had a weak spot, and Satan exploited that, and he got way off of the path. The apostles, the apostles, what happened the night Jesus was betrayed? Every single one, every, every single one of them had said, I will die with you. And they scattered 
And I mean, they couldn't get out of there fast enough. Um, and so none of us is immune. If David was not immune, if Solomon was, if the apostles were not immune, we are not immune. The good news is that we can come back. I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with David. Um, and I'm going to start with Psalm 51. Everybody's familiar with this psalm. So we all know what David did. He uh, committed adultery or rape, depending upon how you read the text. And then he had the woman's husband murdered, killed. He arranged for, for the death of Uriah. And, and it took him a long time to repent of that. In fact, he was content to just leave it swept under the rug until Nathan the prophet finally came in and said, David, David, do you really think God missed what you did? And, and by that time, David's son by Bathsheba was either born or on the verge of being born. So David went for months and months and months pretending nothing had happened. I'm going to argue that he was separated from God. He was in willful sin and separated from God. And when he finally confessed that, well, I'm not going to read very much of the 51st Psalm. We've all familiar with it. But I will read verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. When we truly repent, when we truly reach that point of understanding the magnitude of our error and coming back to God and confessing that and repenting, which means we don't just say, I'm sorry I did it, but we allow God through the Holy Spirit once again to convert us and change us back to children of the Spirit and not children of the flesh. He will receive us as He did David. I'm going to throw out a couple more examples real quick. Um, we all know the story of the prodigal son. I'm not going to read the entire story. Uh, it gets read often in the jail. The men really, really like that story. It gives them um, some comfort that, that the father wants those who go to astray to return to him and that the father receives us joyfully when we do. But I will read Luke 15:20. And the prodigal son arose and came to his father. But when he was still a way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. The father ran, ran to him and threw his arms around him and kissed him. If that earthly father wanted his son back that badly, how much more does our father want us back when we go astray? No matter, and, and it's not as if the prodigal son didn't know better. He grew up. He grew up. He was raised right. He knew better. He willfully said, I'm going to take, I'm going to take the money I have coming and I'm going to go spend it on alcohol and women and whatever feels good. He went way off the path. It's not as if he didn't know better. And yet, the moment he repented and came back, the father saw him afar off and ran, ran to fall on his neck and kiss him. Let's talk just a moment about Peter. We all know about Peter and everybody, <laughs> you know. Um, there's a, there's a proverb, I'm not going to be able to quote it, but there certainly is a saying, a secular saying that's, and, and used to, you say it at work because it was true where I worked for 30 years. You can do a hundred things right and one thing wrong, and what does everybody remember? <laughs> right? So, so we're all familiar with Peter, and we can all relate to Peter because he was brash and he was, he was sure of himself, and, and, and we know the story that, that, that uh, immediately prior to Jesus' being crucified, he told Peter, I'm going to read from uh, Luke, Luke 22, 
31 and 32. Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. And I think a lot of times when, when I hear somebody talk about um, Simon's denial, they get really focused on the story of Peter being so brash and so arrogant, so sure of himself and so full of himself, and then, and then cowering um, at a little girl, at a, at a little servant girl saying, you're one of them, aren't you? He cursed. He cursed. He, and, and he heard Jesus say, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. But guess what? Our God is a passionate, is a, is a forgiving and patient God. And this is what really grabs me. I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brother, brethren. What that tells me is that Jesus already knows that he is going to eagerly receive Peter when Peter repents. And that Peter is still going to be fully qualified to walk in those works God's prepared for him. When you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. That was sort of Paul's calling in life, is to be that pillar in the church in Jerusalem. Even, even when the persecutions began to happen, to be the one to say, hang in there, hang in there, um, to strengthen his brethren. And I just love that God, he doesn't even say, he doesn't say, I've prayed for you that when you dump me, doesn't even bring that up. He says, when you've returned to me, because He knows. And He knows all of us. And if our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, we will return to Him. The men in jail that get so concerned about having gone astray, if they repent, God will receive them. And so, there are a number of passages actually in the Bible about returning to God. I'm just going to read a few of them because they're so beautiful. This is all the Word of God. It's all beautiful. Um, but some of these are particularly comforting, especially for those of us who, um, who sometimes are um, frustrated by our own lack of self-control and by our own sin in our lives. This is uh, Isaiah 44, 22. God says, I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions, and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Okay? Jesus died on the cross to take away our sins. And, and he doesn't say, except for the following sins. In fact, he has a long list of sins, and then he says, but, but you have been redeemed. You have been saved through Christ Jesus. Um, I look at that list and I think, um, drunkenness, oops, guilty. Liar, oops, guilty. Um, fornication, oops, guilty. Um, idolatry, oops, guilty. I look at that list and praise God, praise God that atoning death on the cross and that, and that our God is so anxious to forgive us our sins. This is Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon I'll flip over to Lamentations. Um, if you haven't read Lam Lamentations recently, it's one of the most gut-wrenching books in the whole Bible. Um, the prophet is in exile. He knows that, that, that uh, Israel has been completely destroyed and ransacked and that, and that the Israelites have been, have been spread throughout the known world. Uh, things look absolutely hopeless. And in the middle of this, of this 
lamentation, this, this proclamation of, of, of near hopelessness. Here's what the prophet says. Lamentations 3, 22 and 3. He says, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. They are new every morning. What does that tell me? That tells me when I got up this morning, God said, you know what? That dumb stuff you did yesterday, whoo, it's history. Water under the bridge. It's gone. My mercies are new this morning. I got a fresh start this morning. Would you like to know what I got planned for you today? That's what this verse says to me. Every single morning, no matter how stupid I was yesterday, His mercies are new this morning and He's willing to take me and use me as long as I as long as I repent as long as I come back to him this is Joel 213 the Word of God says so rend your heart and not your garments return to the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and of great kindness and He relents from doing harm. Okay? If we do not return, if we do what Jesus refers to as dying in our sins, we will be destroyed. We will be cast into the lake of fire with all of the other unrighteous unbelievers. But if we return, if we return to Him, when we return to Him, He relents from doing harm. He really wants to do good. He wants to bless us. He wants to bless our homes and our families. And all we need to do is to return to Him. Amen. One more. This is found in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah. Zechariah 1.3 Therefore, say to them, this is God telling Zechariah what to do. Therefore, say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. It's pretty, pretty, pretty blunt. Return to me, and I will return to you. It doesn't say, if you've only committed one little tiny sin or two, return to me. When we return to God, it doesn't... Now, I'm not recommending that you get way off the path. Okay? I'm go In fact, I recommend just the opposite. And I'm going to get to that in just a moment when I wrap this up. Um, there's a principle here. There's a principle in all of this. And I'm just going to turn over to Luke because this is where I find the principle most clearly stated for my benefit. This is, the, this is Luke chapter 17, verse 3 and 4. The Word of God says, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. How many times does the Bible say you are, we are to forgive one another even as Christ has forgiven us? Christ is more merciful than we are. I mean, we have this... I don't know about anybody else, but my flesh... It's kind of programmed to want to get even. You know, want to have the last word. You do something to me, I'm going to do something to you. I mean, we're kind of programmed that way. God's not programmed that way. So if He tells us as often as somebody says, I repent, we're to forgive them. What does that tell me? That tells me that as often as we go to God and say, I repent, His answer is going to be, I forgive you. Now, There's a, we want to, I want to be really careful here. All of this is not to say we should be, we should feel better about sinning. To the contrary, knowing how merciful God is and how loving He is and how desperate He is for fellowship with us and the price that He paid that we could even return to Him. Come to Him once, much less come to Him two or three or four times or seven times in a day. Knowing that should make us hungrier than ever not to grieve Him. Should make us more determined than ever not to sin against Him. 
should make us more, I've used this word, but just make us so determined not to take advantage of the grace of our God and the love of our God. In fact, Hebrews 10.26 does say if we go on willfully sinning, it does say if we can look at this mercy and this grace that God has for us and our attitude can be, oh wow, He's just going to keep forgiving me. He's going to have to forgive me. Um, and I can say that because I believed that for 30 years. I grew up in a church where apparently that's what I was taught. I got baptized when I was 12 and for the next 30 years I thought I could do anything I wanted to and God had to forgive me. He had no choice because I got wet. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Word of God says at all. Um, Jesus warns us about dying in our sins. But, but the good news is that when we repent, when we repent, when we allow God's faith to come into our heart, to change us, so that what becomes important to us is living by the Spirit and not by our flesh. Not only does He forgive all those sins, the Bible says He forgets them. He remembers them no more. He puts them as far as the east is from the west. So knowing this, we should be all the more determined to be a blessing to God the way He's a blessing to us, to be a pleasure to God. For We are created for His pleasure. And I also just want to add that, that, um, that one of the reasons these verses are so comforting to me is because I don't know if anybody in here ever, I, mean, I want to be careful how I use this phrase, but ever doubts their salvation. Um, shame on me if I doubt my salvation because the Bible is so clear about God's love for me and His desire for me and what He requires of me. But sometimes I hear stuff come out of my mouth. And the first verse I think of is, from the abundance of the mouth, of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I think, really? That's what's in my heart? Oh my, I'm sick! <laughs> Y'all are laughing. Y'all are laughing because you've been there. Um, and, and I think to myself, how can I be saved with a heart like this? Fortunately, it's not my heart. Okay, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Wicked, who can know the heart? God, in fact... I love the verse over in 1 John that says, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. I'm so glad of that. I am so glad of that. Um, so I want to wrap up with one thought, one final thought, one final verse from the Word of God. This is, a Roman, this is Romans 11.29. And to me this kind of kind of sums up what I'm trying to say this morning. Romans 11.29 I actually don't even need to look it up, but I did. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God will not change His mind about you. If your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, it's, it's there in indelible ink. God isn't going to, later on this afternoon, He's not going to say, Ted, I sure didn't think you were going to do that. Where's my eraser? If my name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, it is in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, having said that, God will do what it takes to keep it there. He will prune me, right? My father's the vine dresser, and he, any vine that bears fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. He will chasten me. He chastens, he scourges everyone whom he calls a son. And those men who are in jail, who are back in jail, they understand that so clearly. They know why they're there. They're not there because they got pulled over and got caught with a joint in the ashtray. They're not there because they threatened their wife and she called the police. They are there because they had gotten off the path and they were not where God wanted them. And he loved them enough, loves them enough, will love them enough to say, we need to get you back into timeout where you can... And, and I will tell you, we'll just uh, digress just a moment. When, when I see the men that I've known, when I see the men that I've known, 
it, it makes me so sad. But I run up to him and I hug him and I say, I say, hey, I thought you weren't coming back. And, oh, I don't know, 19 times out of 20 or more, they tell me how they ended up back. And it's always, you know, it's always, oh, I had a fight with my wife. It's always, I got so busy working and doing overtime stuff. But in every single story, at some point, they stopped reading this. They got so busy or so wrapped around the axle or so distracted or so angry or they stopped reading this. And then Satan stepped right in because he knew what button to push. They stopped reading this and within a few days or within a couple of weeks, one of the homies comes by and says, hey, hop in the car, I got a 12 back of your favorite beer here or whatever it is. And the next thing you know, they are completely off the path, back in the pit. But the gift and the calling of God are irrevocable. And God says, I love you too much to let you die in your sins. If God has a calling on your life, He isn't going to change His mind. He is not going to change His mind. And if He has a calling on your life, that means that when you do sin, the Holy Spirit will bring that to your attention so you can confess it. When you do go astray, the Holy Spirit will bring it to your attention. Or if necessary, God will chasten you or prune you or do what it takes to get you back on that path. But don't ever think it's hopeless. I've sinned too much. I'm too far off the path. God would never take me back. As long as you have breath, God will take you back. Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. Amen. And aren't we glad? Amen. Can you read? You can't? Who can read? Can you read a little bit? No. Can you read a little bit? Can you read a little bit? You can read a lot too, all right. This is not working out. <laughs> I need someone who uh, reads English. Only. All right, well, I'll just do it <clears throat> the unplanned way. The unplanned way is that we have a lot of people, and I hear them all the time saying, oh, I have to have an easy Bible. No. I want this version or that version because it, it's easy to read, and so that's the Bible I choose. And, and what has happened is we get Bibles and there are all kinds of, of Bibles on the market that we can get. Probably most of us have opinions about them. But there's one thing, and we talked about it in Sunday school this morning. Uh, and in fact, I taught for two years a little a little course in a in a Christian uh, Bible college on the authors the people who are writing these Bibles all the new versions and you know that they're at one time I had over a hundred versions in my library of the Bible different versions some of them were good some of them were terrible some of them were horrible uh, nevertheless they were all there I wanted to see how they how people had uh, translated the Bible and it turns out that they'd translated it very differently depending on their opinion uh, and my course was in the authors of these translations and we started looking at the authors, and it turned out some of the authors were pretty horrible. Uh, things that they didn't believe, 
things that they did believe. And it turns out there's a reason for that. As, as Christians, if Jesus Christ, boys and girls, is in your heart, you've asked him to be your savior, and you've invited him into your heart, you have something that other people do not know, do not have. That is the Holy Spirit. And it turns out if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't understand the Bible. I don't care if you have 10 PhDs. And I had some professors that had three or four PhDs in seminary. And uh, some of those very ones that had the most PhDs were the worst of the professors that I had because they would say things like, okay, boys and girls, it was mostly boys back then, this is the Bible. It contains some of the words of God. And I'm going to show you which ones they are. And I expect you to give the correct answer on the test according to what I teach you. And after class, I went up and talked to that professor and witnessed to him. Uh, he said, son, you come back when you've got three PhDs and we'll talk. And I said, I, I don't think that's probably ever going to happen. I'm never going to get three PhDs. I hope I get out of here. But I'm not going to get three PhDs. And that wouldn't prove anything except that I knew what your opinion was. What is important is that Jesus Christ is in your heart. And he says, okay, that's enough. You're dismissed. That was at our largest seminary in the Southern Baptist Convention. And I was recommended to go there by numerous pastors, good pastors, people that I believed in. And I, and we had a time getting in, except once we got in, boy, the Baptists paid part of our way. Uh, the, the Air Force paid part of my way because I, I had the GI Bill. Uh, it wasn't a problem getting the bills paid. I think even our rent was uh, subsidized. It didn't have anything to do with the, with the seminary. But I've learned that there is a difference, a big difference in what we can understand in the Bible and what we can't understand in the Bible. Not according to the version of Bible that we read. That, that is a waste of time, by and large. But according to whether or not Jesus Christ is in your heart, and if you have Jesus Christ in your heart, you have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will help you to understand. That's why I don't believe people when they say, oh, this Bible's too hard. And some are a little more difficult than others. Some use, I had one that, that didn't use anything above third grade English in the whole Bible. And you could say it was very easy to understand, except by limiting that to, to third grade English, you missed a whole lot. It was a whole lot that couldn't be translated using those words into a way that we would normally understand. But you can understand every person in here who is a born again Christian, who has the Holy Spirit in him or her, can understand the Bible. In fact, every one of you, even though some of you don't read, your parents can read for you. And you can hear it. And you can understand the Bible. Because your ability to understand the Bible is not based on how much education you have or how well you read. 
It's based upon the Holy Spirit that lives within you. The Holy Spirit within you will show you and teach you the meaning of the words of God in the Bible. And he wants you to understand his word. In fact, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. In other words, not only are we going to have it here on earth, we're going to have it in heaven forever. And if we don't have the Holy Spirit, well, don't worry about heaven if you don't have the Holy Spirit. We must have the Holy Spirit to understand God's Word. Doesn't matter how much education you have, it doesn't have, depend on where you went to school or how long you went to school. It depends upon whether or not the Holy Spirit guides and directs you. And if you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, He will show you exactly what it means and what you're supposed to do with it. And as you grow older, He will speak to you differently than when you're a child. And He'll teach you other things that may be it six or seven who's is there any seven year olds here who's seven six year olds how many do we have five year olds how many do we have four year olds okay we've got a good cross section there about out here any four year olds no <laughs> all right here's one that admitted it over here God wants us to understand his word. And he has made it possible to understand his word. Without an advanced degree, without finishing high school, without anything. Because the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives within your heart. And he wants to speak to you. And he wants you to understand what it is he wants you to do in life. And more specifically, what he wants you to do from day to day. He will tell you what he wants you to do. And he will speak to you and reveal to you the things that he wants you to be involved in and not involved in. And boy, that's so important in all of life for us to know that. All right, boys and girls, thank you all for coming.